Um, we're going to go live now. And we are live with the iconic, enigmatic, iconoclastic Steve Barr from Los Angeles. Steve Barr, according to Wikipedia, is an educator, a political activist, and author. I happen to know he's also an organizer uh, from way back. Co-founder of Rock the Vote, the wildly successful campaign to get more people into the electoral process. And uh, more notably for this conversation, the founder of Green Dot Schools and uh, the future is now. Steve, you like to start stuff, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you mean at the beginning, at the forefront of a lot of things. Um, you know, most people choose one. <laughs> Um, why have you started so many things? Why you, where, where's this vision come from? Why do you have so many visions, uh, uh, especially in education? Well, I think, uh, I think it all stems from the fact that I grew up shit poor and, um, was able to struggle out of that. Um, I was raised by a single mom. I was in and out of foster care when I was really young. Uh, by the time I hit, um, high school, I think we, I went to seven different schools in four different states. So, and then when you actually make it and you go to college and you, um, and I, in being white, I obviously could, uh, you know, uh, blend in and, um, and see things that others couldn't. And I got involved in politics. I got the itch about, uh, politics. And in fact, um, you know, before I forget, uh, here in Minnesota, one of my mentors and really good friends, um, along the way was Paul Wellstone. Oh, wow. And Paul and I, I met Paul at, um, um, Francis Fox, Fox Piven and, um, Piven Fox, Fox Piven, Richard Cloward's house in Columbia University when I was working on the Motor Voter Bill. And I think one of the best compliments I ever got in my whole life, the one that, that still stands out, he introduced me to like Tom Harkin or somebody up in New Hampshire. We ran into each other and he, and he, he introduced me as an organizer. And I thought that was always, the, to me, the ultimate compliment. And so, mm -hmm. and so, um, but anyway, getting back to the storyline, I'm, I, um, um, you know, I was involved in politics and I would always look around uh, these campaigns, presidential campaigns, state campaigns. And, and uh, I've, I always wonder where the restlessness was. It didn't seem to be a sense of urgency. And it seemed to be most people that worked in campaigns were subsidized or entitled, you know, not to the fault of their fault, but they were really detached and far away from the people who were trying to help, including, you know, people that, uh, that I was surrounded with growing up. And so, um, so most of my, activism is fueled by a, that urgency and you know in school stuff it, and if you're an organizer you're 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 involved um with listening and talking to people mm -hmm. and you know there is a one of the best parts about being an organizer is you fall in love with the people you're working with to the point where you want to elevate them and create leadership and then you ultimate job is to organize yourself out of a job but you know with the school stuff um with green dot you know going into the poorest neighborhoods in los angeles um, and falling in love with these families who had very little else but their families, uh, most of them who risked everything to, um, to, to come to this country, you know, uh, obviously a challenge in their comfort zones in ways that I could never imagine. You know, I had my own story. You know, you just, you hate letting them down and you hate um, promising things and not being able to follow through. And so it just creates an, uh, a bit of an agitation um, and um, um, and a sense of urgency that I think in most most rooms in politics, you can buffer yourself from. And so, um, you know, and I think that is just, you know, sometimes um, it comes off as, um, um, you know, you're an insurgent or you're, rock, you're rocking the boat a little bit too much or, um, but I mean, I spend most of my time when I'm in Watts in South Central and East LA wondering why there's not a, an uprising every day. I mean, it's uh, sometimes you see things and it's really hard to, to watch on a daily basis. You've talked about some of the generational things like in places like Watts and others. Um, from your own background, you went to your, your mom moved you out of San Jose into the Cupertino public schools and you went to Cupertino High School where there were more um, students and, and, and children of families that were Silicon families, more of the like Hewitt, Hewlett Packard families. And um, it's funny that there could be such a big difference from um, from San Jose to Cupertino and just for reference point I grew up or I, I was born in Los Gatos uh, and and then uh, lived in my very very earliest years in in San Jose um, 
And just between San Jose and Cupertino, there's there was just like a world of difference. But one thing I'm interested in in the way that you tell that story about Cupertino was you say that you did, you were able then to excel once your mom got you into the Cupertino High School. It was a big high school. You had a three pointer shot. You were a sports guy. Um, you said you, you said that you know you're loud and it was good for you, but it wasn't good for your brother. Um, so so. The reason I want to drill on that a little bit is because you've you've talked about that school as being the last of the golden age of California schools where they were well funded and where they were um, they had everything that they needed in some of the schools like Cupertino. But even still, it wasn't good for your brother. Um, and I think that drives a little bit of your story. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the big school, I had a, the perfect big school personality and um, we were a. Um, we had a great basketball team. We were Northern California champs. Kurt Rambis was a, a teammate of mine. Um, uh, you know, and I, I just, I spent every waking moment. If I wasn't in the library, I was on a basketball court and we were just gym rats and that's all we did. And so we had an identity. Um, and if you were on the basketball team, you obviously got, um, you know, you, you got, you got treated a lot differently. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, my little brother, Michael, and this was a 2,400 seat school. I'm the class in 1977. So that's the last year of the fully funded pre prop 13 California public school system. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I recently about not recently, about uh, 10 years ago, got put in my, my high school's hall of fame and I mm -hmm. went back and then the faculty, well, the funny part of that was, is I got thrown out of a, a British lit class right before graduation. And it was a big controversy because I was a student body president. <laughs> and I didn't get to graduate with my class. It was a huge scandal. It was actually a great thing for me. It was like knocking back on my butt a little bit. But none of the teachers that Cupertino were there when I was there. And so a couple of them, but I, maybe they forgot about it. And so I didn't know whether or not to bring it up or not, you know, because it, the last time I was at that school was, you know, when I didn't get kicked out of the, the class. So, um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't get to go through graduation, which was, which was a tough one, but um, I was asked in the faculty meeting. So I, I kept my mouth shut about that because they were there to celebrate, you know, a little work. And so, but in the faculty meeting, they asked like who my favorite teacher was. And it was a real, you know, I don't know if there were any of them stood out. I was friendly with a lot of them. We love talking politics, but there were just so many people and so many adults, the adult ratio to kids. It's a little bit of a, a, a massive version of big picture where you just have like, you just, mm -hmm. there's so many people mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah, you, you can't fall through the cracks. And so at least I couldn't. Now my little brother, Mikey, um, he's a chubby kid. You know, his, um, his glasses never quite fit. You know, he always seemed to have some tape on his glasses. Uh, he would join, he, you know, he would try to do things. He couldn't play sports, but he would try, he was much quieter than I was. And he would try things. He tried to join the band, he joined the band. And, and what do you give the chubby kid? You know, <laughs> the tuba. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you've yeah. seen a it get on and off of yeah. us with a tuba. It's it's both funny and sad at the same time. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, he, he so w our lives started separating at that point. You know, I started, mm -hmm. you know, I became very popular. Um, he went the opposite way. I hung out with upper grade kids because I could play sports and I was loud and they, they thought it was kind of funny. Um, he fell in with the wrong side of kids. This is the 70s. So you can imagine there's a lot of drugs going on. Um, the hardest drug I've ever done is alcohol, which is probably the worst thing you could actually do with drug wise, but he did everything. And so our, our life started separating. I became student body president. He, you know, he got thrown out of school, uh, had to get his GED. Uh, I went to college and he went to the Navy. They went to the Navy in the way that, uh, a lot of poor kids go that are getting in trouble. A judge tells mm -hmm. you to go to the Navy or the army, or you can go to jail type of situation. So that's not the entree point to have a great career. Like you see in the recruitment commercials, but. Um, and our lives just separated and, and our lives could not have been more different um, as adults until um, I was in New Hampshire um, in the 92 camp presidential campaign doing rock the vote stuff. We were exposing voter registration laws in New Hampshire. And I got a call one morning at five o'clock in the morning and it was my mom crying and my brother died. Uh, he had, mm. had an overdose. And so, um, you know, that, that, that was up in that point, I had kind of, you know, covered myself in great, you know, I, I was a published author when I was 27. I was on presidential campaigns, you know, uh, I mean, Rock the Vote could not have been a more fun job. I was on MTV every day and, and we were making big progress. And, and then uh, everything just kind of came to a halt at that moment. And, and, and I was kind of, I was haunted um, for the next five years and um, by how, 
two, and my mom passed away two years after that, you know, and she died from uh, lung cancer. But I think, I think that those last two years, I think her, her, her psyche broke down and her core broke down. And, and so I was 35 and I, w- I went to go work for Disney um, doing some on air television stuff. And uh, I remember filling out the, the HR packet and it said next to Ken. And I'm like, shit, I have, you know, I don't have a next to Ken. I have, a, yeah. I have a chocolate lab, you know, <laughs> which I think mm-hmm. I the name down because I just didn't have that. And that was a really kind of one of those moments where you can, it can either collapse you or you, or it inspires you. And I just kind of felt at that point in my life, I, I was doing good things and, and, Certainly, good things at dinner, at cocktail parties, and we see people, and you're, and people know who you are. But was I really pushing things? And that, along with you know, living in a city that had an uprising um, in 1992, mm-hmm. um, I was mentoring kids in uh, in Watts at Jordan High School, and I saw in them, you know, they were they had to have a B average to stay in this um, this theater program, um, but I knew their their education was shit, and and they knew it. And they were incredibly articulate about, about what was right and wrong with their schools. And, you know, their expectation level was raised. And they went to college and got their asses kicked the first year. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was worse than, you know, you, know, high, you know, leading them into that kind of a, of a failure early in life is worse than maybe not even you know, raising their expectations if you're not going to prepare them. And so, and I identified with that because I'm still, you know, I just turned 60. I mean, I'm still struggling through the chaos and the, uh, um, the lack of structure um, mm-hmm. that I had as a kid, and so I don't know if you ever if you ever overcome that. You know, you're I don't think you do. Actually, you know, we've talked about this. You know, with some of my friends, we've talked about how if you were ever that kid, no matter where you end up in life, people can't see it on you, but it's a secret ghost in the back of your mind at all times. Like the idea that that everything could be taken away from you, or that you could, you know, you could be needy again. I, I, I wanted to start there because I think that that's an important origin story. When we talk about education, we talk about schools, we talk about charter schools. I think we don't really get the full picture of why people are driven to do what they do, right? So you eventually start Green Dot Public Schools. And I don't know, you can tell me a little bit about how this works because you, you saw Locke High School. You've talked about Locke Hi- High School in Los Angeles as being you know, a real example, but also symbolic of what happens across the country. You have these high schools across the country where they're very low expectations. The teachers who get pushed around from other schools get pushed into the lock type high schools. Um, and you, you know, over a period of time, you don't pay attention to it, but many kids are losing their academic life in the, in the symbolic lock high school. You eventually take over one of those high schools and uh, it starts your career of, th- this is very unique too. Uh, anybody listening or watching, I just want to say, when we talk about charter schools um, or alternative schools, everybody wants to deal with elementary or middle school. Very few people ever want to create a solution for high schools. That's like the, that's like considered the, the, um, the harder work. Um, so tell me a little bit about your seeing how you could take over a school and, and why Locke was so important um, um, for you in that time. Well, Locke was down the road a bit and then ultimately we get there. And, and, uh, but um, first of all, that coming from democratic politics uh, and being committed to change and doing a lot of good self-evaluation, am I actually impacting anybody? Um, you know, I was lost after the brother passing and my mom passing and, you know, I was doing great stuff and, one day I ran into Gary Hart from from Santa Barbara, who I knew from when I went to college, not the Gary Hart from Colorado, but the one who created the first charter school law in um, in California. And Gary was a liberal Democrat, but caught a lot of crap for that that law. But he was a teacher and he saw this, the urgency. And and we were talking. We, we actually saw each other at, um, at um, a mentor of mine, a, a professor and a congressman, Walter Capps in Santa Barbara. Mm. And I was talking to him and we were shooting the shit. And, um, he, he, he had mentioned this guy, Reed Hastings and Don Shalvey. Um, Reed was a, a, a restless entrepreneur, um, he'd been a teacher in the Peace Corps, and, and he was thinking about trying to lift the cap on charter schools. And, um, and my, my ears perked up, and, um, um, and I went and, um, and met Reed and, and, and Don, and I, we hit it off pretty quickly. And, and, there were, and it just, there was something about that moment in time, being around entrepreneurs and being around people who are not afraid to fail, because most of our lives are driven and our, and, and our work is, 
and careers are driven by fear. You know, you don't want to be embarrassed or anything like that. But there was just something about that time and place where I was restless, depressed, in search of meaning. And then I meet these two fellas and, um, and they're full of hope and, um, and want to revise something. And so, and in my background being in democratic politics, my frustration was, what is the point of this? I mean, if, if the democratic party can't figure out how to lift kids out of poverty, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and I'm, you know, uh, my, my, one of my political heroes is Pat Brown. It was just this amazing, you know, figure, Jerry Brown's uh, father, who created the great America, you know, the great California education program. I mean, it, it was the, you know, and I was a, I was a, um, you know, I may be glorifying it a bit, but some historians might push back on it, but I'm, you know, I'm a benefactor of that. And to lift myself up and then not be committed to that was, was shameful. And then I was still haunted by Mikey, my brother. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I was sitting on the couch one day and I was reading the LA times and there was a front page cover that said that, you know, Los Angeles, um, was a hundred schools short of serving um, uh, just a secondary high school population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that high school in 33 years and the population tripled. And the only thing that happened in those 30 years that coincided with that is, is white people and black people had fled the system. And you had an 85% Latino school system. Mm -hmm. you know, with a, with a healthy percentage, maybe half of the percentage of people that are not documented with no political power. Yeah, and I just want to add a wrinkle to this for people listening or watching. I just want to add a wrinkle. So you were 77. Is that what you said? The class of 77? Yeah. So in about 76 or 77, I was living in Baldwin Hills, um, which was the Black Beverly Hills of the time. But we were being, every morning, I would go out the front door and everybody from my neighborhood would get on buses going to schools in different directions. Right. And it wasn't that black people had fled the system. It was that we were being dispersed because right. of integration. And I was being bused to, of all places, Bel Air, <laughs> right. right? Where I was just, where they just totally welcomed kids with afros and just wanted us there a hundred percent. Yeah. You know, it's just, it was the most amazing time of my life. It was beautiful, except for it wasn't. Um, but, but I just want to say like, you know, um, it always seems like there's something happening to black and brown families that isn't happening to the white population, which remains r relatively stable or that what re remains stable is they get the best of things. And LA was a microcosm of, the, you know, you were graduating at that time from high school. I was in, you know, fourth or fifth grade at that time. And, and um, my view and my remembrance of that was um, people being excited about all the wrong things, like sending me to Bel Air wasn't like a solution for my community. There were no great schools nearby or near enough to me. Um, and LA seems to, to have stayed like that. When you talk about the green dot schools and the schools about like, you know, how many of the locks there were, I think at some point you said there were like 30 lock type high schools, but there were not a ton of great high schools in certain parts of the city, the, bl the blackest and the brownest parts of the city. Um, I, I want to for fast forward because I think this is good origin story stuff, but um, I think why, why is it that we forget that reform and the idea to reform didn't come just out of nowhere? It didn't come out of a sense that we want to destroy the public schools or we it, that are working perfectly fine. It didn't come out of a sense that we want to privatize something because we're ideologues, because obviously you've just mentioned a whole bunch of Democrat uh, people, Democratic people from the, the Democratic Party. You could add to that list. Uh, Bill Clinton, um, which you, you know, you have, you had interaction with, um, Pelosi, you mentioned Paul Wellstone who said he's from, what did he say? He's from the liberal wing of the liberal wing or something like that of the democratic party. Um, um, so I just wanted, this was a good background as a basis, but you have a different profile when we talk about, uh, charter schools, because, um, you weren't coming from some ideological point of view. You had a reason. There were, you were seeing things in the real world and you wanted to accomplish something real. Um, uh, why do you think we have lost that in the narrative about charter schools? And do you think it's fair to say that maybe charter schools took a wrong path or or maybe they're just being un, unfairly characterized? Well, I appreciate that because um, maybe, you know, and I've, I've watched a few of your shows and you seem to be touching on something. I, a few months ago, I, I, I had a, um, when Robin Lake wrote a piece about um, the tribes or you know, what does it mean to be a good um, friend in the charter movement in the 74. And it was a really kind of a it was it was a great piece because it was it was a reevaluation. 
And I just, you know, I don't go to many of the conferences anymore. I just like, you see the same people all the time. And I always check to listen and see if, you know, Chris is going to be there. <laughs> I don't go to all, I don't go to them, but when you do go to them, it's, they were getting to be very depressing and downers. And there was always a session on the big bad unions are, are being mean to us. And then there's another, you know, but there's no real reevaluation of like, it's good to have your butts kicked from time to time just so you, you know, you figure out the next path. And so, um, uh, but I think you're right. I think we've gotten so tribal and so bizarrely intense about our our tribe and our our you know, charter schools. And then there's this union and it's just this constant back and forth. And to be honest, it just pours the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. And it's an incredibly creative group of people who can, you know, in some cases, reverse the achievement gap, cannot figure out how to find some mutual co-option amongst um, a group of people who are, uh, looking for good work conditions, you know, it's something that simple. When, um, when you say that, you're saying that the teachers and the unions are basically people of goodwill who are looking for better work conditions. No. Oh. <laughs> no, no, I'm no not okay, sure. yeah. Okay. It's a group of people, meaning yeah. teachers, and so you know, and there there are plenty of like you can you and I could spend three hours talking about. Uh, the fault lines of unions and the fault lines of charter schools. But mm-hmm. it kind of remind me of, it's funny, my son is 11 and he just started, he's a sixth grader in middle school. And you just remember what an intense time middle school is. It's even when everything's mm-hmm. perfect, right? And um, and he got in a, a rumble with a kid. He was taking his pens or something and, and Jack, you know, pushed him in the middle of class and they, they almost had a fight. And I picked him up and you know, my son is just stubborn, just like his dad. And we we're driving home, and I and I told him a story. Like I think most dads probably tell their sons. You know, there's something about that uh, when you're called out, or there's that first fight, and you're sitting in the principal's office waiting to see the principal. Something weird happens. You end up becoming friends with that person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really it's kind of the funniest thing. Like you, and now my son in the wee hours of the night when he's not being parented well, and he's on his Xbox, and I can hear him screaming and squealing and. He's with that kid that he got in a fight with on his Xbox playing video games. And so they became friends. And I always looked at this because I came at this um, as an organizer and from politics. I came to the charter movement a little bit unique in the fact that I was not an educator. Um, uh, I wasn't a business person. And I think those mm-hmm. are things. I was, uh, this is a political problem. This is not an educational problem. Mm-hmm. And so you have a, but you have a, an amazing amount of people that are drawn to this who have no political skills. Mm-hmm. And, and somehow that it got as far as it did without that, um, what, what we're seeing right now is that, that backlash. Um, yeah, I think you're asking the right questions. How did we, how did we lose our ability to communicate? Um, how did we lose the storyline? Mm-hmm. More importantly, those are those are minor compared to how have we not, after all these years, found a way to find common ground? Because I think as an organizer, you go into any situation or you don't go into a situation thinking that you, you do agree on 80 percent of the stuff. You just got to mm-hmm. get 20 percent of the stuff you don't agree on. And mm-hmm. so I always looked at um, public education and the, the chance to fix it or to to improve it that there was a lot more uh, what teachers wanted and what we wanted. And I think at, at its, at its mo- most minor, tiniest um, piece that you would look at, you go, well, look, there's, you know, there's, I've never been to a good school that doesn't have good teachers. And there mm-hmm. aren't that many of them. So they usually go where they're treated well. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you just think do you, about Do you that, really believe that though? Do you really believe that? So, so uh, let me, let me challenge that just a little bit. Right. So, um, Minneapolis public schools, um, teachers union president, one says to me directly, if you want better schools, give us better students directly, just openly says it, um, when we're talking and, and this is in terms of talking about our abysmal record with, with helping kids of color, by the way. And the response is, if you want better schools, give us better kids in one of the negotiate union negotiating sis, uh, sessions with the teachers. Uh, union president, we were trying to get out of the teachers a two-year commitment um, at our worst performing schools. If you're going to teach there for two years, or if you're going to join one of our schools that we're trying to turn around, you have to at least give a two-year commitment. And the union fought us on that exact words from the union president. It's a rite of passage for teachers as they gain more seniority under their belt to shop for better schools and better kids, right? Exact quote, right? 
um, and was negotiating that into the contract, right? So, so I love your your um, push to find the common ground where you can, and you obviously have been successful. You 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 were able to um, produce a thin contract with teachers that created better pay for teachers, better work environment for teachers. Um, and didn't hit all the third rails of education reform, and you weren't uh, clumsy about it, right? You did. I think you, you but there's one of you. <laughs> well, that, that, <laughs> you know? that, okay, first of all, the first part of your thing, I don't want to dwell on it, but we all have our stories. Yeah, about yeah. The whole union guy who did the wrong thing. Listen, no, I, I'm in the middle. I, I'm unionized, and I go through that. Okay? Yeah. So that happens. And I've also met you know, charter school people that, are as disgusting as anybody. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like they, they, we all have, we have, our, we all have our villains and I, I don't want to get involved in that. Um, but now I like to focus on the second part that I always get that. Well, you, you're you. <laughs> you did it because you're you. Yeah. You're special. Yeah. yeah. So I'm special because, you know, when I was growing up, uh, the worst nightmare that, you know, when you think back on your childhood, I'll mean, think back on our childhood, there are times when you see your parent humiliated in front of you the first time. Now, how old are your kids, Chris? I have a range of kids from 30 to, to 10. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, you, yeah, I still have three yeah, in the public school know, system. Yeah. You know that uh, the when they're younger, you're kind of, you know, there's going to be that moment when you're not a God, when, you know, like I sometimes will drive around and I'll think, mm-hmm. I don't want to get in a skirmish with somebody and a road rage and then you know, you're sitting there getting a yelling or getting in a, you see people getting fights at ball games. You're like, what you're in front of their kids. You're like, Oh my God, what a horrible moment. Well, for mm-hmm. me, it was always those horrible moments where uh, my mom was exposed was usually around healthcare. We grew up without healthcare mm-hmm. and it was a constant mm-hmm. fight. It was a constant um, degrading and I could go to really graphic stories, but I won't. When I was 18, I got a job at UPS. Um, hmm. This is in 1977, you know, right? You know, my, when I turned 18, mm-hmm. I get a job at UPS. I became a teamster, and you know, up on Lawrence Expressway, um, off the off the uh, the 101, right near where the new football stadium replaced Great American Park. There, um, there's a UPS um, stadium, and these trucks would sit out in the sun all day. And at four o'clock, the loaders would come, unloaders and loaders would come in. I was one of them, and the, the trucks have a hundred and 30 degrees in them and you couldn't wear shorts mm-hmm. and we would work and work and work. And every night I would lose five pounds and then go have a beer and a slice of pizza, put your weight back on. It was, it was like the closest thing I'll ever come to prison, that job mm-hmm. because it was mindless and it was excruciating, but I was a teamster and I had health insurance and I had not had a health insurance. I had the best health insurance. And there was just something about the way I felt about that company um, and the way I was treated and the sense of pride of having health insurance for the first time that I, I can't even explain. It's just, it was something meaningful. So I, I understood from an early moment, and I think what's missing is a lot of people um, in the charter movement, I hear this all the time. Well, I, I know nothing against unions, or I was in a union once, and mm-hmm. there's just something about when you're in a stressful job or uh, uh, you're up against it, that collective voice is important. That, that's just the background thing. Mm-hmm. And so when I started Green Dot, um, I, I had talked to some folks at CTA that I knew because I used to shake them down when I was a, a Democratic Party fundraiser. I got to be friends with a lot of the higher ups. And so I talked to them about this, that where is the progressive push on, where is the responsibility for these kids? Kind of in, in the spirit of what you talked about with that, that union president. Mm-hmm. And, they, and there was a sense of responsibility and they were very open to it. And so they were literally my first partners at Green Dot were the California Teachers Association. And so, and the reason why it worked for me is I asked them. Now, here's the interesting part of it. The contract, the thin contract you talked about, was authored by the the first 12 teachers that I um, picked. And they believed in what we were talking about. They had gone to those schools where 1,500 kids in ninth grade become 500 in 10th grade. You lose 1,000 kids, those, those 20 to 30 schools across the city. So they were they were they were on the same page. And a friend of mine who worked at CTA says, when you go into negotiations, don't bring a lawyer. Teachers are with you. They're, they believe in what you believe in. They're going to caucus. Every time you push on some issue and they go back and caucus, the negotiator, mm-hmm. the teachers are going to 
be with you 95 percent of the time so right? so just so on that point though do yeah. you still think that about the cta now do, i mean is this a past thing are you talking in the past or are you talking about in general as a as a rule we would we could do better with getting teachers in negotiation are you saying that the times maybe have changed like you you experienced that back then but it would be a harder thing to do now it will be harder but it certainly won't be harder than um trying to figure out how we get charters passed and if there isn't even a charter movement anymore and so mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. you know we could spend a lot of time on that the, the 2000s you know when i first met randy weingarten and uh, you know and i and, to, and and right now as we speak i'm still the chair in the south bronx of a charter school that i started with randy weingarten and she's still on the board and she's probably the best board member i've ever had on any in either of my organizations mm -hmm. and that means when our 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 evaluation system has to kick in when we have a teacher that's not improving Mm -hmm. we, we, it, it has, it has worked in that school mm -hmm. and she's been a strong backer of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so yeah, it, the, she's a great, so I'm just saying I've seen it work and I see it work every day in our schools and, and it's not unique to me. And I, I, I always like, that's a compliment and I appreciate it, but it's also like, yeah, but it's not just because I'm, you know, no, because I've been, I've given teach-ins on this charter, on, on this, on this, on this um, contract over the years. Mm -hmm. and there were times when that contract was elevated to the, you know, Arnie Duncan's office, and this could be our turnaround charter um, 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 contract, and everybody agreed on it. Can you imagine what unions would look like if we would have taken a mm -hmm. cost contract with a steep evaluation system that was developed by teachers at 30 pages? That contract... Okay. So let, let's drill down on this a little bit, Steve, because I, I want to like, I yeah, want to yeah, exercise yeah. this thing about whether or not it's unique to you. I want to exercise this point a little bit. So there's a couple of things that stand out to me. Number one is that the teachers union nationally, two of them, two national unions have, um, have a bully pulpit. They have a leadership position within American education politics. They have infrastructure, foot soldiers, and um, and lots of capacity to do things. So Randy Weingarten has this um, experience with you with a school in the Bronx. She has another one too that she starts by the way that didn't work out. And and the 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 it, that's important to bring up for this one reason. When they started that other school with the UFT and the district in 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 uh, New York, the idea was they wanted to prove that the contract wasn't the problem and that unionized teachers weren't the problem. That school closed, um, having done poorly, very poorly over the years. And, and I don't think it's fair to say, what was the problem? I, you know, I, I'm not qualified to say, do the forensics on it and say, but what I can say is it didn't work out. I'm only bringing it up. I only think that's important because if I was Randy Weingarten and I ran the association that represents educators, and somebody passed the law that allowed us to start our own schools without the bureaucratic tape of big administration and central government, I wouldn't need Reed Hastings or anybody else to start schools. I'd be starting my own schools all across the country. And to do you one step further, I don't want to preach about this, but Minnesota, a lot of great things come out of Minnesota. I live in Minnesota. We gave you charter schools. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we also have a law here. I read Joe Nathan's book 40, 30 years ago. I mean, I, I got the whole Ted thing. Colby, Ted Colby, Joe Nathan, uh, Amber Wright. Yeah, yeah. um, we gave you guys open enrollment, you know, uh, lots of things. But the other thing that we did after charter schools was teacher-led schools. We passed a law that allowed teachers just to start their own schools, period. And it didn't have to be a charter. It didn't have to be like a separate charter school. It could be within districts. And I believe that law is maybe now 12 years old and we've had one school come well, out of it. Back, let's back up. You, you've got a, There's a lot of good meat on the bones. There. Okay. Um, yeah. First of all, I'm very familiar with the school that Randy started um, <laughs> because not, the New York Post loves to talk about that school every time it fails. And then 10 people call me and go, hey, that school you started with Randy, it doesn't seem like it's going that well. And I've got a <laughs> different school. Not yeah. And then, but I would think um, in candid moments, Randy would probably tell you, and just that we, that's how we met actually right around the time that school opened. Um, there was a Progressive Policy Institute um, um, gathering of about 30 people in DC. And it was a lot of um, union folks that seemed open to reform. And then a couple of charter people and, um, and Paul Hill and Andy Rothenham, um, you know, took hmm. us through a day. I met Randy 
You know, and Randy, in very candid moments, talked about, you know, the skill set it takes to run a school is different than a skill set to run a union. Mm. You could actually mm -hmm. take that even a step further. I think that over the years has been an acknowledgement. Um, and I use a lot of crude analogies and metaphors with, with basketball. You know, LeBron James is not, you know, with these teacher-led schools where you don't need a principal. Mm -hmm. Well, LeBron James, right, Kobe Bryant didn't want to coach the Lakers, right? They, 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 they need a coach. They want to play, but they want to be supported. They want to have a say in what goes on around them. They want to be have a little bit of a give and take. And I think that's very, very common. So this whole notion that teachers are going to go out and start schools, you know, uh, my wife's a teacher. She doesn't want to be a principal. You know, she, you know, she wants to she wants to be in the classroom and there are administrators that go that are, used to be teachers that hate it because they lose that connection. Um, you know, and that's a deep connection that folks have. And so, but, but isn't that part of the like the Al Shanker vision of what this was supposed to be like teacher collaboratives starting? Well, that's schools. A great. That's yeah. the great connector is that my understanding of the history of Al Shanker. And I was sometimes I introduce myself. I'm from the Al Shanker wing of of the charter movement is a way to show off teacher voice. Now, this is this is really a big part, and this is the, that 80% that we agree on is a big missed opportunity. The, you know, around that same time, the national unions, both of them, they did a deep dive. Um, they talked to all of, you know, as many members as they could about what, and it was, a, it was the, the big issue at the time was 50% of first year teachers were not making it through the year. And what was the deal? Hmm. And they, and they interviewed private school and public school teachers. John Perez was the president of the United Teachers of Los Angeles at the time. And we sat down and talked about this after I saw him on a radio, I heard him on a radio show talking about it. And the biggest reason why private school teachers don't last a year is that the money doesn't add up. They just can't support themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefits, the money, all that kind of stuff. The biggest overwhelming reason why most teachers don't make it to the first year in public schools, and I think overall, is the inability to have any say in what goes on in front of you, meaning it's very centralized. Right? All the decisions are made far away from you. You're not really included. Mm -hmm. you know, if you go to a lot of urban schools to this day, they have reform fatigue. You know, It's like every two years it changes. A superintendent gets traded out every two years. Then they bring in their own new thing. They're not included in it, and it's foisted upon them. Now, this gets back into my organizing skill set. You know, at least what I learned as an organizer. They're very unempowered. And so the best of them will retreat into a classroom and do their work. And the other stuff is just noise. Well, that's a sad workplace. Um, and so there was this, there was this great potential where charter schools, so at Green Dot, what I learned pretty quickly in, from listening and observing at the beginning, most of the things that we did at Green Dot, of course the teachers were involved in it because they're the ones closest to the students. If they're not attached to some of the decision making, um, they're not going to. If they don't have skin in the game, they're not going to. Like a, an intervention project, I'll give a perfect example. We use Read 180. We were at the beginning of it because we had a. I voiced it and pushed this whole notion that technology was very important, obviously. And even though there wasn't a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a light shined on that. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't been integrated, but I just thought it was important that kids had the tools that the rich kids had. And I thought also I needed a to something to get the kids to leave the regular public schools with Friday night football and their friends to come to these schools. And so every kid got a laptop first year. But and we brought in five or six different intervention things. And it was, a, and it, was it was teachers that with us together and read 180. They're all about the same read 180 just uh, utilize the technology more. And that's why they picked it. But the teachers had a say in it. So when people go, wow, why do you guys, why do you guys read 180? Well, the teachers picked it. Why do you have this, uh, you know, evaluation system with uh, multiple multiple measures, and it seems pretty strict? And well, because teachers designed it, we asked them to design their own intervention project, and and teachers are really tough on each other. But the, so, the, so I'm getting a little lost, though. I'm getting lost, Steve, on this point because it sounds like a little bit like you're making my point in a way. Trust teachers. Teachers have the expertise. They need to be part of the decision making or whatnot. If I were leading the major organizations that represent the professionalism and the expertise of teachers, I wouldn't be fighting lawmakers and others. I would be showing them how it's done. I would be creating lab schools that that I could point to and say, obviously, we're the experts because here's our example of the way it should be done. We have the legal possibility to do it without anybody giving us permission now 
Yeah, uh, but I, the, you don't I, need permission. But get back to the my crude, you know, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James. You know, the Lakers don't win five championships without Phil Jackson. Mm-hmm. And I think if you ask, or, or, or if you're watching The Last Dance, those, you know, Michael Jordan didn't win a ring until Phil Jackson came along, seven years into his career. So is this you so, saying, though, we need, because this is going to be a very tough one, um, that we need um, more, we need a bigger pipeline of good principles, which it doesn't seem to be one. <laughs> like we're not, we don't, I don't know where good principles come from, but it definitely isn't like there's not a big feeder pool of them. But what you're saying right now is you do still need good principles. I mean, maybe we got stuck on the same as you thought. I don't need, yeah. think you need principles. I think, yeah, you need, and not because you need some authority figure, you need support. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when, when you know, in, in um, 2004, I think it was, when Phil Jackson left the Lakers and had a year and then came back. I don't know if you remember that, basketball history. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. He actually worked, he volunteered at 826. Um, Dave Eggers um, reading group and they were launching in Los Angeles and Dave called and said, Hey, my um, um, Phil Jackson's ex-wife works with me and she thinks Phil would be great to, to do a, co- to do uh, help you in LA. So in Animo Inglewood, we, we, we published a book underneath the radar at the time. And I can spend a lot of time with Phil Jackson. We just talk about this stuff all the time. Like how do you, and there's a lot of great analogies with sports, you know, not every player, you can't expect every t- teacher to be Kobe Bryant. There's a, there's a, there's a, at every school, there's like a, there's, I call it the one third theory. Mm-hmm. One third of the teachers are like spectacular. Mm-hmm. They're like, mm-hmm. oh my God. You know, you, you just look at them and they're the gods. And then there's a third of the teachers you wish would get lost on the way to school every day. They're just horrible. <laughs> and most of the time, it's not because they're horrible. Yeah. They're, they're not yeah. trained well. The yeah. expectation level of their, of their work, which is deep in many different levels, is there. Yeah. And you get a middle in the, that will go either way based on the culture of the school. Yeah. Right. So if you have a good leader and some A play A players, those those middle school middle group will elevate. And you'll also be able to go back to the bottom with the culture and 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 elevate some of them too. And then you also have to accept the fact that it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, just, mm-hmm. this, this is our this may not be the right fit for you. This is not mm-hmm. a place where you can hide. And so that theory, if that's your vision for your schools and it's consistent and you're hiring people based on that. And you have a collective bargaining agreement that also honors that. Because, you know, union contracts, when you really peel them back, are, are reactions to systems. And there's no more fucked up systems in this country than urban school systems. So the reactions are going to be fucked up, too. So you see, that's why you get 600 pages of reaction. Mm-hmm. In your vision and, you, and, 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 and the way you run your schools, and if you're consistent, the reaction is, should be much less. So when I first started the first contract, Everybody warned me, oh, my God, that that contract's going to be just like the others. They're going to get a hold of your schools. And, boy, you're a moron for doing this. No, they stayed pretty much the same. Mm-hmm. They've been changed in nuance, but it still fits the vision of the school. Mm-hmm. My, and I thought after doing the first two or three of these, and it's what Arnie Duncan once said to, to, you know, to the reporter from The New Yorker, and the guy misconstrued it for something else, the cracking of the code was there was an ability for charters and unions to come together. I thought once we did it that all the other charter mo- groups would go, oh, my God, there's a contract that we can work with, and they've accepted it. They're really worried about their density. Mm-hmm. Every time a charter opens, we lose membership, and we're a membership organization. Well, this fixes that, and we can go – and we can both go take on centralization, uh, teacher voice issues, work conditions, teacher preparedness, the big issues that really should elevate the profession. We never get to that point because we're arguing about – sharing sp- I know, all this bullshit, real estate and th- these, these side issues. And so mm-hmm. that's still, that potential is still there. It is harder now because of the hurt feelings, you know, because of everybody's story about the union person who did this and did that. I come from politics where you fight all day and then you go have a beer at night. That's missing in the charter movement. Really? I don't think that's missing in the charter yeah. movement, Steve. I think this is a great conversation for us to have because I feel like for everything that you say, that is generous and protective of the integrity of teachers and their unions. I'm going to be that guy exactly for the people that spend hours writing 180 pages to start charter schools and use their own money, time, effort, take away time for their family to start a school because they have a mission to educate kids that are being left behind only to constantly be beaten up 
by some moron who was a bad teacher in the classroom and became union president locally, and no one can tell the truth about that. People will say it privately, I'm a school board member. I was a, a part of a chain of school board members nationally. We would trade stories. And it wasn't a story about reformers and everybody being awful people trying to come in and privatize everything. We had your green dot contracts. We took it to our union and we weren't the only school district that said, hey, there appears to be a collaborative path forward only to be hit with. We're not interested in that. We spent years tripping, uh, chipping away at the managerial prerogative of the district. And we have no interest in going your direction because we fought hard to have all those things that are in the contract now, right? Like when I came on the board in Minneapolis, we had a 280 page contract. St. Paul had like an 80 page contract. And what we figured out was like 200 of those pages or so weren't even enforceable. They were just a bunch of stuff that had been added over time about teacher professionalism and all this stuff. So I don't want to be like the day after Christmas on this like generosity about teachers and unions, but it's going to be a hard play on people that have had, have been savaged by them, have had their motives and their integrity hit. And it feels like a little bit like self-flagellation for reformers and people who've started charter schools to take the blame for like what they've experienced in trying to just start a school, man. Like, I mean, just start a school because you you feel like there's a need, there's a burning need to do it. Um, so help me out. Like, I feel like yeah, I just yeah. walked off a plank. So walk me back on the plank. Yeah, but you, but you, you but Chris, you sound like that kid um, I'm sitting next to waiting to talk to the principal. You know, you've got your stories and your reason for being in that fight. The other kid's got a story and, and a reason for being in the fight. I could Except, sit, but we're not equal though. No, well, we're not I, equal. Yeah. It's not two kids sure, fighting you, though. I could sit with union people and they'll go on and, you know, if I, you know, I could play the whole, well, geez, you know, you, you had extreme members of your charter movement who tried to end unions and you know, tried to end tenure, you know, pick fight, you know, we're, you know, you guys are got us on the run and this is what you guys do. Instead of figuring out like how we come together, what we end up doing is fighting. So those feelings, you know, yeah, I've actually been in meetings where charter people from Minnesota pulled out a, an article written about them. It's laminated. They carry around with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, you've got your hurt feelings. Listen, there was a room at UTLA that was just dedicated to tearing me down at one point. That was a room. There was a room that was. Just, I get yeah. it. Yeah. This is, yeah. you know, when you. But but the basis of the charter movement is when you. I mean, somehow I mean, to meet people, and I still do. I meet people in the charter movement. Or educators like I just hate. I, I love everything about it. I just hate the politics. Wow. Well, every kid that comes to your school brings money. That is, and and takes um, revenue away from a public a public school system. That's as hardcore of politics as you're going to get. So the reaction is going to be hardcore, and we can't. We got to lose our hurt feelings of it. We both all have hurt feelings, you know. This is this is like the IRA. I and think it's more than hurt feelings, though, isn't it? Though it's a little more than hurt feelings, right? And I and I don't think it's equal. I don't well, think the, I don't think like it's a false call, equivalent, if right? Call, if you would if you would have called me and said, "Hey, um, yeah. I'm on the board, and we like your contract," and you know what I would advise you to do is I would. I would educate some teachers about the strength of the contract, right? And the work conditions. And then check. I would have teachers talk. We did that. Yeah, check. We did it. <laughs> you mentioned Locke High School before. Yeah, yeah. Perfect example. I mean, it really was what the, what the best the best story about Locke High School was there was this, I, this notion that somehow I rode in my white horse and st stole the school from the school district. Mm. That's the story, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I, I was actually working on an exit plan because I was exhausted and I had two small kids and I'd done 10 years of Green Dot. And then these group of teachers who we had relationships with because that's where the Teach for America group was, is the Locke High School. So these group of teachers, we, you know, we had hired a bunch of teachers from Locke High School that were either going to take a stand at Locke or, oh, well, yeah, we're hearing about that, how great this thing is at Green Dot. Let's go work with them. So we'd hired 30 or 40 teachers. They were talking to each other about Green Dot in the, mm -hmm. in the contract. They came to me and I went and there's a, you know, it's well documented in a New Yorker piece. I, you know, they, they were pitching and arguing amongst themselves about what to do because decisions were being made about their school and they were not involved. And at least I was sitting there, but I didn't have to say much to the teachers were talking to each other about the work conditions, uh, you know, self-determination, <laughs> you know, autonomy, 
all of these great conversations and they liberated the school. Much to my surprise, I'm like, man, you got more than half of the tenured teachers mm -hmm. to say, you know, and you know, there was a famous, there's a famous line in the, in the, in the, in the storyline where one teacher got up after five hours, I brought pizza and I brought Chad Solio who had, who had been a teacher at, at, at Locke high school is now open to school at green dot. And they really taught the questions were kind of flying his way. But after five hours of this heated debate with tears and passion and almost mm -hmm. fisticuffs and all this crap, one teacher just got up and said, you know, let's face it, man. The only time our, our school district comes out to this school is when a kid gets shot. So that's the expectation level of that school and that, and that group of teachers was, if, as long as we don't get a kid get shot, they'll leave us alone. Mm -hmm. They're not going to give us any help or support, but at least won't show up here. And then another teacher, shut, like, like, on, like, just immediately said, and the only time our union comes out here is when Steve Barr comes out, is, is mentioned to come out here, and Green died. And I remember watching that going, oh, shit, we just got this school. Because they all nodded their head on that. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that is not the, listen, A.J. Duffy, who was the president of the union at the time, who just passed recently, he, he couldn't, they wouldn't even allow him on the campus. Hmm. The, the protocol was the union president of the, 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 the chapter chair had to invite you on the campus. The union president could just walk on the campus. Mm -hmm. Their relationship was so broken. The district. So what I'm saying is, I think you mentioned that before as a microcosm where, where this all ended. Well, it's also where I looked at it, where it began, too. I mean, mm -hmm. what could have begun. But we, we, we decided to dig in and entrench and keep thinking that somehow we were going to change 100 percent unionized industry in some states with non-union labor, and somehow that's going to work out for us. Or that you wouldn't be attacked. I mean, even what you do, your schools are attacked. I mean, unions attack your schools. Like, you have a, a union-friendly situation. I know a couple of your schools where um, where I have respect for some people running a school who I think are good people. And, you know, privately, we never talk openly about, like, what really goes down oftentimes. Yeah. They're being attacked. Right. Yeah. Like even though they're doing they're they have teachers best interest in mind, they're paying their teachers well, they're respecting them, they're trusting them, they're empowering them. And those teachers are also talking on behalf of their own schools and they're still being attacked just like anybody else because they have a C in front of the type of school that they are. They are a charter. Um, and this is my point around. It's not really. The reason I feel like it's a false equivalence is because I don't know dedicated groups of charter people that are trying to kill public schools, but I do know dedicated groups of people who draw dues every month who are dedicated to trying to write things into the district policy that eliminates charters as an in, as even an option, right? Um, and I don't know what to do about that other than fight. Like, like there's a point in which you've taken enough hits to the face where if you're a scrappy person, you start fighting. Like, you know, you can, there's a lot of talking we can do. There's a lot of negotiating we can do over time. But somebody keeps trying to kill you. At some point, it's no longer like you can't expect goodwill anymore. It's like we're in a fight. You are literally trying to take us off the map. Um, and, and I guess that's what I was, I'm looking for and what you said, because you've been somebody who's been so rare in that you've been, you've held this middle space. You've been able to have a hand in both places. No, and I appreciate you that. Know. And that's not that's not just good politics. That's um, good stewardship of a of a of an organization. Green Dot succeeded and continues to succeed because we get teachers, and teachers say this to me all the time. We just had our twentieth anniversary when we spoke at the, the, this gathering. You know, there's fourteen hundred people work at Green Dot. Uh, there's fourteen thousand kids being served. Um, my, my son goes to a Green Dot school in Boyle Heights. Um, he, 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 he is very proud of it, 300-seat school. Um, I'm integrating that, that school with the Y1 white kid, and he's having the best time. He just loves that school. And he chose that school after going to look at a different bunch of different schools. But we get teachers, and that first thing I asked Jack, I said, well, do you like this school better? Is it harder after the first couple of weeks? Because I have to drive to pick him up. It's not in our neighborhood. And so we have these great conversations. He goes, um, the school is much harder, Dad, uh, but the teachers are much better. Hmm. And, the, and his his um, his school, where the middle school where he was going was a school that people send their kids and they have choices and it has magnets and all that kind of good shit, right? But he, and the reason why we have that is because we attract teachers who normally wouldn't work at a charter school. Like if you're a really, if you're an A player teacher in LAUSD, 
like if, you know, and I'm I'm a recruiter, right? I'm you know, I'm I'm John Wood <laughs> and I'm recruiting or, or Bobby Knight or whatever the hell the the, the the guy is now, but um, and I'm recruiting and you're an A player teacher in a school district and you've got a mortgage or you've got a couple of kids. And in that district, you know, you can't change the system within that system, but you're, you're set up well. Mm -hmm. you know, you're a star. Are you really going to go work at a charter school that uh, you become an at will employee? Mm -hmm. You may have some opinions that are different and you may be sold on this idea that you're going to have a voice. Would you really go work there? We always looked a little more grown up to most of those teachers. And so, so we would attract teachers that normally wouldn't work at charter schools. It gives a huge advantage in recruitment. You know, there's a teacher shortage now, so we're all stuck in wind, but we still have that mindset. You know, there is something about um, when you're a teacher, when you walk into the, 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 the dining room of Green Dot, you're not gonna go, they're not gonna, we're not gonna say, we take care of you, we don't need a union, go sit at the kids table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the other room, the card table that collapses around the room. That's where you want. But we're taking care of you. No, you come sit with the adults. You're part of this. The union president sits on our board. Um, you know, it's not always pleasant. It's not always fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always easier to be a dictator, right? Well, and but, I do want to say that, I, like, I'm because I'm I I visit a lot of schools, and I have over a, a period of like 13 years. A lot of them have been charter schools. The level of teacher collaborative uh, collaboration, I'm sorry, in charter schools um, is much higher than people ever talk about. I don't no, see no. them as like autocratic kingdoms in some ways. But the point that you just hit on actually is making me think a little bit more. Um, you do have to do a good job of attracting the teachers that you want, the ones who are going to sign on to your educational philosophy, the kind that aren't going to come in and sabotage something that you've already set up and you've already done over time. And I will say in districts, here's two things I want to say. In districts, you will have groups of teachers that have started an educational philosophy in a school, kind of like the ones my kids go to. And it only takes a small critical mass of teachers come in who don't like it to actually really have the power to upset what teachers and educators have already agreed to. But the other flip side of what you're saying is you draw talented people to you for good reason. You give them a good place to work and you pay them well. If I was not a good teacher, if I was mediocre and I knew it, if I was driving in from the suburbs every day and I was a different race than the people that I'm teaching every day and I have low expectations of them anyways and they're not my kids and they don't look like my kids, but I feel entitled to the job that I have and the, the pension that I have and all of that, I would want to stay with the district. I would literally like that would be the best place for me would be to stay in an urban district where I, I am embalmed with lifetime rights to a job as a position and someone might fire me if I were in an at will situation. Yeah. Now, is that too negative? <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, it, it comports no, with my reality. Right. Yeah. But you, I mean, listen, there's nothing what you just said um, we aren't focused on, but who is in charge? I mean, so if teachers don't have a buy-in, so I'll give you a perfect example. Lock High School, wow. I thought I'd saw everything. And then when I went to New Orleans, I saw even worse. Hmm. I, thought tw I mean, this one teacher at Locke High School, I, I heard about this guy. He was drunk for 20 years. I go, how do you mean you're drunk for 20 years? He has been drunk for 20 years. He got up to yell at me at one of these community meetings, and he was slurring and spitting. And I just, I didn't, he didn't introduce himself. I went, is that the teacher? I just, or the guy next to me, I said, is that the teacher who's been drunk for 20 years? You keep telling Yeah. Yeah, that's been for 20 years. That's so terrible. <laughs> so, so I took, terrible. I took my daughter, Sophie. We went to Locke one day uh, a, few, a few months back, and we were driving back, and she was kind of mesmerized by it. And she had seen it. They, my kids grew up at our schools, but they were little. Now they're, they're 14 and 11. Now they're starting to figure it out a lot more. And so um, we were talking. She goes, man, Daddy, that's amazing. It was, I always heard. So I, I played. I was just on my phone. There was an NPR uh, story about Locke and um, – uh, I played the beginning of it. I just wanted to hear the beginning of it where a teacher confronts me and he's so inarticulate. And he's like, wow, these, these kids are, these, these kids are gang kids. They ain't gonna wear your uniforms, your mm. booty, and, your and he's yelling at me in front of these other kids. And one of the kids just yells out, he's, he's gonna make y'all wear your, he goes, and, and the kid goes, good. You know, and it was this confrontation. But I was trying to explain to her like just the, the that, that if you heard this teacher try to articulate his argument in a public forum with, <laughs> it, just, it was so bizarre to me. I always wow. look at it, this was what passed is 
teachers. Now, what got us over the hump at Locke was the vast majority of teachers may not have been for charter schools. They knew there were teachers like that, and they were ashamed of it. They were the middle third. Mm -hmm. They weren't the exceptional, but they were the middle third, and they were embarrassed that there was a third of these teachers that were there playing out their contracts, hiding. A lot of them didn't have proper credentialing, which we found out um, pretty quickly. Um, we just <laughs> we did a little background. But these these become hubs where people go and become long-term substitutes. They never leave type of teachers. Mm -hmm. We expose that. and but that was But the teachers had to be empowered to expose it. It wasn't me manipulating things. So your, your critique in mean, pulling out the worst of the worst is completely right. And I'm just as outraged about it. How do we, how do we change it is the bigger thing. So mm -hmm. I'm just a little bit of that. Um, well, what's your answer to that? How do you change it? Cause like where I'm coming from is I don't share your idea that this is the worst of the worst and that this is uh, pulling out exceptional or outlier stories. I see it as being um, similar to the police department problem that we have and when we start raising the idea that we have cops that are kicking our asses in cities we have a whole group of people say why are you beating up on law enforcement and they have a tough job and we should just you know like we should love the police and blah blah, blah. and what i hear in that is i hear they're your police yeah you have you have had a different experience with your police so you have a nostalgic belief in what they can do for you these are your judges your police officers, your public defenders, whatever. So all these nostalgic notions that we have about everybody who's employed by the state, including teachers, who drive in oftentimes from somewhere else with a different kind of cultural um, um, cultural time zone than the kids that they're, they're living in. Um, there's just a different level of how how much of an outlier it is, for instance, the, the, the bad judges, the bad cops, the teachers that actually hold very, have very wrong opinions about the kids they're teaching and, and whatnot. So what is the, the political way forward um, now that we're in a very tough time with charter schools and unions and state legislators? And, you know, like California is a great example of where every, everything's working against charters, I think, in some ways right now. Um, what's the way forward? Well, the first thing is, and it's a, and you you deserve a huge amount of credit for it, Chris, which is and, and Howard and Chris and I'm, I'm, I mean a whole group of folks are, you've put a face on this thing now. You know, it's, it's I can't I cannot go and you know uh, middle aged white guy and 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 call out this 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 idea which is just maddening where. We, I live in Silver Lake in Los Angeles, like Brooklyn and New York, or, you know, it's just an enclave of white liberals who talk a good talk, but <laughs> they're a little tough on the follow through. And so, and they'll give me shit about it because they feel guilty about the fact that they send their kids to private schools, you know, and so they'll, they'll jump on this, uh, charter schools are evil and I'll get in these conversations, you know, and, um, but if they had to send their kids to Locke High School, um, they would be my best mm -hmm. friend. Kind of the line I used mm -hmm. to say, you know, if you want to fix public education in America, the fastest way of making private schools illegal, it would happen like in a That's summer. That's so right. That's would, so right. They would get right. in a row. They get they get McKinsey and Bain, and they would say, "What's working? How do we scale it up? Give us a plan." When we get back from the you know from Martha's Vineyard, you better have a plan and let's get it going. I mean, that's that it would be it would be swift. Mm -hmm. I understand that part of it, but the idea that white friends of mine in Silver Lake bellow on about charter schools that, and, and I would always say, them, it insinuates a couple of things. One, that the people who are choosing these schools are stupid and you know better. That's right. How dare you? That's right. So when I have these wait lists and people are begging us to, to, to grow faster and be smarter and you fall in love with these kids and you've got to play God with kids' life on lotteries and all that crap. And at the same time, you're trying to work with the district because Here's our R and D. Let's work together to fix these 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 dropout factories. It's not like we're just cultish, like we're about it. We're mm -hmm. and we're trying to work with our union friends and all that stuff. So that's the maddening part. Or that these teach, or that some of um, the CTA dual dues that my student, my teachers um, pay, are going to mm -hmm. rip me or Marshall Tuck or somebody else. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can get just as fired up as the injustices as you can. But what you've done, which is I think the first thing that mm -hmm. needs to happen. Is is black and brown families need to be the voice of this, and I need to. I feel guilty even leading anything at this point because it, it, I feel like a failure as an organizer in the in the the finest tradition of Paul Wellstone and 
and those folks. I have not organized myself out of a job. It's getting better. You know, I see it when I take Jack to, um, when I first walked into the uh, Animo uh, Ellen Ochoa in East LA, I walked in the first four teachers and, and um, counselors I saw were former students at Green Dot that came mm-hmm. back to our teaching and counseling. That's the first layer of it. But where's the, you know, the generational, uh, you know, uh, middle ground where you become the voice of this. That, that makes people uncomfortable and that mm-hmm. educates people. And that's important. The second part is, and this is the part that's controversial and hard, but I'm I'm a living, walking proof that it can happen. Is we gotta we gotta sit down with unions who. It's not like um, because they've beaten down the charter movement that everything got better. It's still there. There's still demand out there. There's still injustices. There's still centralization. There's still common mm-hmm. putting that out there that we should be going after together in this system. But we have got to have a dialogue. It can't mm-hmm. just be, oh, well, Steve Barr's different. You know, well, he's wacky and. <laughs> you know, I don't think you're wacky. I just think you. I think you're occupying some really rare space. I think you know. I don't think you're wacky. I think you. You might be. You might be a genius. Well, the good um, news that is, you've made it happen. You know. Well, the, good, the good news is, is I do hear there's a lot more of like, hey, what you just said, like not the genius part, but we should be figuring this out. But what? Why aren't we? Well, the charter movement, and this is a tough part. This is the tough part of the charter movement right now. It needs to, first of all, it's good that we're having conversations like this and we need to have a ton more, you know, and I also appreciate the fact that you are having them and forcing them, you know, and even open mind enough, even with all that scar tissue you have from your experience as a school board member and as a parent, most importantly, as a parent, Hmm. we need to have these conversations and we need to explore this potential. And it's harder now because of the, the last 10 or 15 years, but it's still there. There's still a common need. There's still a mutual co-option for the greater good to be had. That is something, that's just the hard politics. And if somebody doesn't like that or doesn't agree with it, then what's the alternative? Well, and I think that's the good point. That's the good point to rest on. You You and I should keep talking because I think what we, um, I have so much respect for you as a person and, and what you've done and whatnot. And I'm like really kind of studying the idea. And I think, you know, this isn't the first time, like I told you years ago when I was on the board, we pulled the green dot contract and brought it to our union as like a productive thing to do. Like, can we talk about this? We brought the pilot schools from Boston to Minneapolis to talk to our union. Our union sent them home like with a no, thank you. You know, so so it's like it, it's not. I think we're we're hitting on two profiles, two personas right now. And yours is is one that's necessary. I think mine is necessary, but I think the two competing ideas are, are collaboration versus fighting. And actually I am in this space right now um, because I feel a little bit like that country that is surrounded by enemies um, that had better get its military up to grade soon, right? That's how I feel about charter schools right now. I'm, I'm not in a collaborative mood because my assessment of the landscape is different. My assessment of the landscape is they're out to kill us and they're doing a good job of it in some strategic places. And we can't ignore what they're doing through legislation, through their their politicians that they've paid um, and through their systems that they're taking over. And they have no interest in collaboration. Right. But I'm happy to be wrong about that. Like, I would love to be wrong. I would love like like um, what you have already have experienced doing to be the way like for that to work out. But when I look at LA and I look at California and I look at things like Pennsylvania teachers union trying to stop charter cyber schools during COVID when we need them, you know, the LA teachers union fighting breakfast in the classroom and needing SEIU to beat them down on that because it's good for kids, you know, having uh, um, unions in different places, parts of the country fighting school choice just in general, because everything's a threat becomes hard for me to find the common ground. um, But I want to be wrong. Like I want your way uh, um, to be the right way. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a healthy way of looking at it. Not agreeing with me, but the healthy way of looking at it is I look at everything you just said, and those are all, uh, yeah. If I was a teacher, and then I've got to feed the kids, and I, you know, it's new, and I've already gotten ten other jobs on top of my work conditions suck. You know, my wife was a teacher for three years in Watts. Now she works at KQD. She gets up at four. She used to get up at four thirty every morning. Mm. And go to bed at six thirty or seven. Guess what? She still does that. <laughs> it's like even though she's not a teacher, she's just used to that pattern and that workload. You know the uh, 
the story I told the, the Green Dot 20th anniversary, this is a little bit of um, uh, 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 digressing a little bit, but it kind of feeds what we're talking about. We went to Gelson's one day, this is a bougie market in our neighborhood, and um, on a Saturday afternoon, and, and Teresa, um, Friday nights was the best night of her week, and then Saturdays were good, but the dread of Sundays, mm -hmm. to prepare for Monday, would overwhelm the weekend. Mm -hmm. it, it was really this consistent pattern that would take most teachers go through, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a Saturday afternoon, we go to Gelson's, and, and this guy walks up to us, and he's a great, he looks like a triathlete, uh, Latino. I mean, he has a beautiful baby. And he's like, just like he just went and worked out, you know. And he goes, hey, are you Steve Barr? And he goes, yeah, you know, I work at one of your Green Dot schools in South LA. And um, I, I just want to thank you. I mean, I really love the system. I've never met you. And I really, really appreciate it. And mm -hmm. I'm not touching because, you know, I think I probably didn't clean the house the way I should have that morning. <laughs> I was probably already in the dog house. And, and he's uh, gushing. And I'm holding his kid. And it's this beautiful moment. And I look over at Teresa and she's just looking at him like, what the fuck? I just says, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? and, and she, the guy he gives me a hug. It's very emotional. And he leaves. And Teresa goes, I go, what's up with you? And she goes, fuck him. Why is he so happy? Right. Yeah, why is he so happy? I want yeah. to be that happy. Now, all of this conversation we've had about the politics, why we're union, all that kind of stuff, I think adds up to why that guy was so happy. He felt supported. You know, it just it was a different program than what she was used to on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. He wasn't overloaded. He was maybe getting his and I but her and that truth thing was so perfect because I think that's why teachers feel like, and that's the opportunity too, is that teachers are over. I mean, it is the most so they're easily and they're also easily when you're up against it manipulated for oh it's it's those fucking charters and it's it used to be mm -hmm. the, it's the superintendent's evil and you know it's this constant thing and it's easy to manipulate we have to be creative enough to take the best of what we do and have now you keep telling the story about being uh, the, the bringing the, the green dot contract now if i would have brought six teachers out and they would have had to sit down with the union like we've done like in denver and other places where we've implemented and i just shut the fuck up and let the teachers talk to each other it gets a lot easier so that's an organizing skill set that I just I can't tell a teacher what's great about teaching, what is needed in teaching, but teachers that work with us can. Mm. That's just you know what I'm saying. So that yeah. that conversation needs to happen on a national basis, not that hey charter schools are the are the end all. A small group of them that are really successful over a lot long periods of time. What is going on with them? And they have great ambassadors like that guy at the at the Gelson's or, you know, uh, you know teachers that been in both systems mm -hmm. or like those teachers at Locke that talked and convinced the majority of those tenured teachers to join them. Well, I think this is a great place to land. Um, Steve, I thank you for coming on today. I would love to have you back and keep the conversation going. The people who have been watching this and making comments, a lot of them are parent activists, and they see this very much through the lens of the parent. Um, I think you um, have offered a vision here that um, is a, gives us more of an insight on the politics of how this works, which I think people forget, and also the, the, the educator perspective on this. Um, you're not going to draw good people uh, in into this uh, I don't want to call it a fight, but the 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 best you can do to get uh, educators on board, you can't do it without being worthy of drawing them to the table, right? Like, or to the workplace, or you know where where they are. So, um, I want people to go and check out your new organization. The future is now. Um, I have been scrolling your Twitter handle across the bottom of this the entire time so people can reach you and find you if they want to talk about it more. I'm serious when I say I want to keep talking, though. I want to have you back on because there's like, as you were talking, I felt like eight different things that we can expand on. Would you come back and unpack some of those so we can teach folks? Uh, listen, uh, I, I've, I've watched a bunch of your um, interviews. I, I think uh, it's such a refreshing conversation to have. Um, and I like that we don't agree. We don't have to agree on everything at the beginning. It's not that. We don't need another goddamn echo chamber. <laughs> um, That's the know, last thing we need. We have to hash this stuff out. And if we can't do it at this level, we have no chance to do it nationally. Mm -hmm. The good news is in the presidential race, you know, there there's a consistent conversation about raising resources for teachers. There's also a consistent under the radar. Uh, I think our nominee in the Democratic Party is not anti-charter. 
Um, I think you'll hear when you're really pushed, a lot of the candidates will say maybe for-profit charters are tough. I know you have a problem with that or, or, mm-hmm. or vouchers of this, but, but non-profit charters in historically failing areas where there are partnerships to be had could be our net um, to, to really kind of bring the, this thing to an end here, which is, mm-hmm. you know, that's the potential to build on because there's still parts of Los Angeles, believe it or not, that are failing the majority of the kids. So our work is still needed. It's just we're not, uh, but we have to, we have to, we have to, you know, check ourselves a little bit and then and then get smarter about politics. You know, the French have a great saying. When I was a young man, and I dated a French girl in college for three days, it was traumatic and and <laughs> up on me. I was so, so haunted by it. But she gave me like she was blowing cigarette smoke in my face. She was. She said to me that the French have a great saying: "Do politics before it does you." Mm-hmm. And that's really one of my life lessons: do mm-hmm. politics. Before it. If you don't like politics, don't. Try to reform public education. Yeah, we just got to. Well, we, I think you're right. We need to fight and and not r- relinquish. We also need simultaneously to have the peace talks going on. And is there a third way and all that kind of crap? Yeah, because that's really where you get change. Well, maybe we need a good cop, bad cop. Maybe you and I will do a buddy cop movie. Right. <laughs> uh, we'll be good cop and bad cop. Steve I, Barr, thank you so much. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend, the iconoclastic Steve Barr, who has started many things that I respect and care about, including Rock the Vote, which gets more people in, which got a lot more people into the electoral system um, as voters and active, active, right. right, active citizens. Um, the founder of Green Dot Public Schools, which has been a, um, you just mentioned third way, but has been um, a new way actually of bridging the gap between warring constituencies. And uh, more recently is the founder of The Futures Now, which you can find online if you Google it. Thank you all for listening, for watching. Steve, thank you so much. My pleasure.